Happy No Comic Book Day Geeks, and welcome back to another bonus episode of the Script Heroes Podcast. Today we're doing a bit of a catch-up. Uh, I know that you've been desperately missing our weekly voices here. Yeah, we, but in we've the been gone for a while. Summer, and the uh, curses of technological difficulties. <laughs> uh, we've, been, we've been away, which means yes. we have a whole lot to catch up on. So yeah. hopefully in this bonus episode, we'll be able to get through all 11 polls uh, that we've uh, been enjoying over the past few weeks. Uh, and looking forward to our future episodes, we'll throw in a couple new number ones with their accompanying number twos. Yeah. I think Which that's our plan for Ninja Turtles and the new Daredevil series. Those were two mm-hmm. number ones that we missed and we should be catching up on, but we figured we'll just lump them in with the, with the issue twos. And uh, maybe the Dark Knights of Steel one, depending on how busy that week is. We'll see yeah. if uh, anything else grabs our eye. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, we'll see how that goes. We'll see how that goes. But, but we're starting off uh, from with, four, three weeks ago? Four, four weeks ago. Four um, weeks ago. Three with, episodes ago, if that makes right. sense. Yeah. Um, we, <laughs> we are going to start with Ain't No Grave, number three, a series that we have been quite enjoying oh, on yeah. this podcast um so yeah let's let's just get into it with the uh, description of ain't no grave issue number three Ryder is aboard a riverboat where she must gamble for her fate against the mysterious madam gates if she plays her cards right death will be within her sights if not this will be her last trip down any river the writer is scotty young the artist is jorge corona the colorist is jean francois Belli. And the letter is Nate Picos. Katie, why don't you start us off with your thoughts on Ain't No Grave issue number three. I love Ain't No Grave so much. <laughs> this book, it's, it's really just doing everything for me. Uh, like we've mentioned, I'm in my, uh, I'm in my Western renaissance and like suddenly so into cowboy <laughs> books. Westerns and, and pulp books have taken over your exactly. imagination. Yeah, yeah. And Jorge Corona's art is so gorgeous. We've mentioned the way that he works with color, um, and I feel like this is just even more uh, emphasized in uh, in this issue where we go to this riverboat and we have these intercut flashbacks and everything in the riverboat is just basked in red. Not like red light uh, or anything. I, I, I'm, I'm going to throw out that that's uh, Jean-Francois, I believe. You, you yes, said where he I, I, praising the colors, so I just wanted to... You know, fair enough. Fair the, enough. The I, I presume the artists are working together on the colors uh, in terms of like, yes, this is... Here's my art. Uh, but in any case, uh, the whole team, the, the way that they create the vibes in the flashback to contrast with uh, the present in the the riverboat is so gorgeous. It's so beautiful. Again, just the character designs, the way that movement happens in this book, everything feels so alive and so expressive. It, it, it's it's absolutely gorgeous. And that's not even to even get to Scotty Young's writing, which is also so so great. In this issue, we see uh, her gambling with this like kind of purgatorial uh, figure to get her mark so that she can go uh, and try to kill death. But we also see her from years ago sitting down at a gambling table like with a bunch of bankers and the way that her like kind of bandit self conflicted so often with the life that she was trying to lead with her family. Absolutely. The scene with her and her husband kind of talking about that is written so well oh yeah and it's, it's it's so engaging and it's probably my favorite sequence in this issue which is maybe wild to say an issue that has these beautiful like poker sequences from somebody who who loves poker if you <laughs> finally the background comes into play um but uh it's interesting this book is so interesting because it has like almost such a like compressed not even necessarily timeline like kind of time but like plot like the end point isn't that far away from the starting point, and yet they have mm-hmm. to, like, you know, get, I'm assuming five issues is the, the run of this out of it, whatever it is, five or six or whatever it is. Um, and the way that they do that by, like, one, you need 
fantastic art that can keep you engaged in like mm -hmm. a plot that isn't moving and i'll get to the kind of the b half of this because this isn't fully true but a plot that isn't moving like super far forward with every issue um you need incredibly engaging art which is here and is incredible and keeps you super into it and then the kind of b plot of that of like yes the plot isn't like moving by leaps and bounds but something important happens in every issue that like oh, yeah. affects the plot and that's the other way that's kind of how they balance this very interesting i'm not again i'm not gonna call it a compressed timeline i'm gonna call it a compressed plot line because i think mm -hmm. that makes more sense to like the way that this story is being told and it's something that like if you explain to me as a writer i'd be like no that's dumb like do a one shot or do like a you know do something short like don't do this as a series because it's not gonna work if you're starting here and you're ending up here and only this is happening but when you actually are engaged with it with Roy corona's artwork with the mm -hmm. beautiful colors with the way that everything's been put together with the dialogue um that's so engaging and kind of these flashbacks to this family dynamic that's making you care more about the journey like it just works so well it's something that and like i think that's what blows me away about the, like this issue it's something that i don't think should work as well as it does like on a conceptual level if that like this feels so much like execution over concept if that makes sense oh yeah for sure i mean the entire issue is essentially her sitting down for a single poker game that, yeah exactly so yeah, I just want it to give such so praise good. to the execution because this feels like mm -hmm. this team could do almost make a comic about almost anything, and it'd be fantastic because, again, it's a cool concept, but for the the timeline, it feels so much like it's execution over concept to me. Fully agree, fully, fully, fully agree. So good, so wonderful. Oh yeah. Do you have any final thoughts on Eight No? No, Great? I think I just gave like my surmise thought, not just on the That's issue, so kind of on the series, but I think this issue exemplifies that more than the other ones because I mm. think the, especially issue one, definitely had more like of a traditional type yeah. uh, story. And I feel like so much of what you're saying, uh, it has to do with like the loving time spent on the environment and the world because so much okay. of it is just like looking. At what's happening. Visual there. world building. You you talked about that a lot in Lotus Land. It's also yeah. very true in this book. Um, mm -hmm. The visual world building is very very strong. Yeah, we we love Ain't No Grave, but we've we got an old love to to keep us company. <laughs> we do. Again. We get to go back to uh, the hunger and the dusk. But That's now right. it's book two, issue number one. Let me let me get to my my notes on this. Not that I I, I know. When, there we go okay my my note like my note app on my phone is so stuffed with all of the issues that we have <laughs> like it's hard to actually find some anyway the hunger of the dusk finally back book two issue number one after the falling out between cal and tara love is lost and the fragile human orc alliance has ripped at the seams the last men standing are sitting dusk ducks without their healer and their enemies have multiplied as ruthless vangal and ro rogue orc dynasties stroke the flames of war terra could become civilization's last hope for peace but she may become a distant memory when a fresh face joins the battlefield g will wilson is of course the writer with uh, artist christian wild goose uh the colorist is michelle sask and the letterer is simon boland katie we have been very positive about The Hunger of the Dusk all the way yes. through. We're finally at book two. Um, yes. A lot, kind of... Th this is an interesting issue, so I'm going to just throw it to you before I, I end up just going off on my own. <laughs> <Wait>. <laughs> yeah, so when we had left off, uh, Cal and Tara had, like, started their romance, they were, like, in love, and then they had a big, uh, a big fissure and Tara left, and... My biggest complaint with this is starting with right complaint. I'm starting oh, oh, with you're gonna, complaint. It's the same one I think that I have. Yeah. I'm gonna go off about how much I love the rest of it. Um, my biggest complaint is one that I have had about previous issues, and one that I have also contradicted myself with on previous issues. I'm so mad that we didn't get like any Tara in yeah. this in this issue. Like, <laughs> I have a long note about that <laughs> with how. Issue six, five? Six. Issue six of the first series ended. It, it very much was like, it was very like kind of Tara focused and, yeah, and like kinda. the start of her journey there. And I'm like, God, 
Damn it. I love the last man's I love the last men standing so much. They're my favorite characters. I love the like group dynamic of them. But I wish that we got some Tara in here to kind of like check in with her, especially after, you know, seven months of yeah. of not having the book. And I'm like, no, give me and all yeah, the like, like, I don't know if have you got this vibe. I get the vibe that like next issue is gonna be all Tara and no last men standing, and then we'll come together in like the third issue. I, I think that that's probably it. And again, I know it's a little uh contradictory because of how often I was like, oh, get away from the orc storyline. I just want to hang out with the last man yeah, standing. Yeah. Now I'm like, no, take me to the orc. It's just also good. You want all of it in the same Exactly. Issue. I, I want continue. all of it and I want more of, your, of it. Your, you know, with the, the, the rest of your, uh, your, your book thoughts. Uh, yes. So uh, this is another book, uh, like Ain't No Grave, where the book is incredibly good on its own and it's made so much better by the art. Like, Christian Wild Goose's art is such a strong part of the identity of these books. Uh, it's what makes the orcs and the Vangle and the humans look so distinct. It's what makes the action so just thrilling. Uh, truly, there's such, like, a, an important fixture in this. And, oh my gosh, is it awesome to see just new art from him. Uh, yeah. It's it's so exciting. We get to see a few very exciting battles and we get the kind of same thing that we had before where during the battles they like remove all the white space so that everything's all crammed together, yeah. which I still just think is so badass. Uh, we get awesome character beats. Uh, we get to see more of Sev, oh, yeah. uh, who's the bard, uh, which we kept complaining about because we like him so much and we weren't getting enough of him. Um, and yeah, it's it's a very strong comeback that I think is is pretty clearly laying the plot out in front of it of like, okay, I see where we're going with this. And and yeah. I'm excited to go on that journey with them. I fully agree. It's interesting that you, the, the art is fantastic, but it's so like different than how Ain't No Grave works. Like Ain't No Grave is kind of set up where like, okay, we're going to have this plot that doesn't have a lot of room to go. So the art can just be bombastic and take your attention in every moment and every issue. And you're going to be focused on great, how great the art is. This is kind of the opposite. This is a book mm -hmm. where, the fantastic art serves to exemplify the story, which is meant to be what's really captivating you. Yeah. So it's just such an interesting look, like doing these issues back to back, like how different comics can go in like what you're supposed to be focused on and how you're supposed to. Oh enjoy. yeah. Not, not that you're supposed to enjoy them in some way, but what they're putting forth and how they're trying to kind of capture your attention. But anyway, mm -hmm. I agree with you. No Tara is a little bit, you know, sad. I don't love the like, okay, we're going to jump here and then we'll go to Tara and then we'll, Maybe come back together, especially in mini. If you're doing it ongoing, I'd be, and I think we talked about this when we talked about the last issue, I'd be a little bit more into it because it's like, okay, I know we have X, like infinite more issues essentially to do mm. stuff to get when it's like, we have six issues. If two of them are spent like on bottle episodes on specific characters, now we only have four issues of like the, 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 the joint thing. So anyway, going to throw that to the side because this is a fantastic issue it's and it's just, it serves so well to reestablish the characters in the last minute. Mm -hmm. It's like, ah, oh, yes. That's who he is. That's who they are. Here's what happened. Here's how where they're going. Fantastic reestablishing. And then goes, okay, we're going to reestablish Cal. And then we're going to change Cal completely. We're going to put Cal through the mm -hmm. ringer. Give him all these character beats. All these character moments. Make him actually consider who he is. His place in this war. What he wants to do. And it works so fantastically well. Reestablish. Change. Move the series forward with what the plot's going to be for this miniseries. Mm -hmm. works so well is so good like you said it, we also get great action in here to kind of break up the just character moments because it's establishment it's the first issue no yeah. plot arc happened the plot setup happened but it was a exactly. great setup but, but we got a character arc in that plot setup so like so much is being done and being done so well and i love this issue now i have a question for you yeah because yeah. uh you one of your uh you know gripes with uh, the previous series was that the last issue of it was like kind of, kind of bottle episode almost because yeah, yeah, it was yeah. it was like just focused on Tara. And you're like, yeah, it didn't feel like a, a real end to yeah the first yeah. thing. Do you think this, with the way that Cal's character arc ends or you know finishes here, do you yeah. think that this would have been a better issue six to the last one? Yes. 
Yes, I did. I was reading it and I was like, mm. uh, and well, that I might have actually like really that might have that might have been a better ago. issue one too of a new art. So <laughs> maybe they should have flipped. But in any case, we'll see where this goes. I do think this would have been maybe better. And that's why I'm talking about, like, I don't think that would have been a bad arc ending if it was an mm. ongoing and this came out in the next month. And you were like, For ah, sure. okay, yeah. here's how that goes. It's just, it's how miniseries kind of put forth certain content. Like, I, I think sometimes mm. it hurts you more than it helps you. I think that's an example. But this was a great return. Like, this is a great oh, issue yeah. for a book that's been on a hiatus. Like, this feels like a very good issue to jump back on with or to jump mm. on in if you're new so if you haven't read hunger in the dusk you can almost certainly find a collected edition of the first oh, yeah. volume and would but this is a perfect place to jump on at least to see if you're interested in the world and the characters and then maybe go back and read the first volume. anyway yeah i digress did you want to hit no, on i was anything? very excited to ask you that because i was like, no, oh, no, 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 like I, I hadn't thought about it but now that you say it i do think maybe maybe they should have been but i'm not it's not my book so we're gonna no, you no. know uh and we love it anyway like, yeah, their creative has earned the right to do whatever the hell they want because it's been great. Exactly. Just Speaking of creative teams cheapest. that we love, yeah, yeah, it is time for monsters are my business, and my business is bloody. Number four, the series conclusion. It is a standoff between monsters, and Grizz is caught right in the middle along with a killer koala with a chainsaw, a necromancer who wants to sacrifice him, and a secret agent he doesn't trust. Grizz stands between the mutant horror of the howling gargoyles and the mutant horror he has sworn to protect. And, as if the situation needed a little more kick-in-the-teeth flavor, the gargoyles are under the sway of none other than Grizz's ex-girlfriend. Uh, this is coming at us from Cullen Bunn as the writer and Patrick Piazalunga as the artist. Uh, and... I believe he also... The colors are Marco Bracco and the letters are Jim Campbell. Yep. Do you want... Jay, how do uh, you okay. feel about, so... hungry, uh, <laughs> about Monsters <laughs> on My Business? About hung Hungry Monsters? Yes. Um, no, it, it's so much fun. It's just such a fun book. And this issue does some really cool stuff. Like, it's interesting because they kind of give you an initial conclusion and then just an issue of fun kind of after that. If that mm -hmm. makes sense with like kind of the way that it's structured, I love the way they deal with. with I, do we ever get a name for Grizz's ex girlfriend besides like Demon and she calls herself Mama or Mama no. Me or whatever? Like, I don't know if we ever get a full blown name for her. Um, but it, Grizz is always like, ah, oh, that's my ex girlfriend. So Grizz's ex girlfriend is dealt with in such a like fun and unique way. And I think one of the things uh, I don't know how often I've talked about it on the podcast, but I've definitely talked to you about it, Katie. Is like it's so hard, especially in like action or fantasy or whatever, like comic books to come up with solutions to problems that aren't just big fight heroes win fight, you mm -hmm. know? So to see something like this, where something unique and interesting is done. And I actually went, Oh, that was super cool. I really enjoyed that. I thought that was a lot of fun. Like that just makes me so genuinely excited because a comic was able to do something that I wasn't really oh, yeah. like, expecting. And that that's really always such a fun thing. And on top of that, you have uh, Patrick's fantastic art, which mm -hmm. just makes everything look so much cooler and more exciting. Like his art has such, I think we talked about this before, but like a, a, a like nineties action hero feel. Oh, yeah. And I love that for this book. Oh yeah. And there's, there's few out there that write better dialogue than Colin Bunn. And it just gives so, all the characters between the art and the dialogue so much personality. And then you get the fun action and the cool ending here. This is probably my favorite issue of Monsters Are My Business. I thought this was fantastic. I He's really so like this as an ending. Um, because it's like, it's open-ended to be like, oh, we, we could do more in this world if we wanted to, but it's still a very satisfying ending. Mm -hmm. And it's just a fun ending. And I loved it. And I feel like it, it's just such, it's such a perfect button for what has been such a fun series. Like, Absolutely. at no point does it decide that it's time to take itself, like, seriously or anything because it's 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 not built for that and no it's not trying to do that and that's what makes it so phenomenal like speaking to the the like 90s 80s action hero thing we literally have grizz like silhouetted by an explosion at one point like oh, yeah. you don't get more like kitschy action than and like that. the final end like i'm not going to spoil like the the ending right. but i'll spoil the ending page because i don't think Mm -hmm. that's really is like 
this cool like movie poster action pose with all of them like walking like that you know like you end on a freeze frame of all the characters Ooh. walking away looking badass like it's just it's the vibe man the vibes <laughs> and i i love so dearly that this book is so good at the vibes like yeah. it is it is a book built on goofiness and silliness and it pulls it off so well it's one of those things where I feel like comedy can so often be like very flat, but oh, like yeah. you said, because of the way that Colin Bunn writes his characters, it feels very alive. Even the the you know koala with a chainsaw, it's it's not that it's. I mean, it is particularly funny that he is a koala <laughs> with a chainsaw, but the joke is never just koala with chainsaw. It's, oh, the koala with a chainsaw is also doing something funny. Yeah. There was the one joke that was koala with a flamethrower, but that was so predicated on Patrick's artwork and, like, being Mm -hmm. like, I'm going to draw this so stylized badass, like, where it almost looks out of place in the comic because it's such a, like, (laughs) badass action shot. And it's just this koala with a flamethrower. And, like, and I was thinking that also, like, works on the level of them building that anticipation as he, like, goes after the gift. It's it's also, like, the payoff to that. Absolutely. Oh, man. And there's just, like, I don't want to spoil the, like, really funny thing that they do here. Because I think it's, like, the... I think that's what you really should, like, you know, read this issue for. Yes. it's so funny. But there's something that's done, and then there's, like, an explanation flashback type thing. Mm-hmm. And that is Which just again, so Which, very classic, like, action movie type thing. Oh, yeah. 100 they, they They play in all those tropes in the funniest way possible. But the that flashback sequence where they're explaining is just so funny and so, so funny. absurd i love it i enjoyed this issue so much like i said it's my favorite issue of the series i think easily so cute so good but not the only book that is just incredibly vibes based i was gonna say I, I, I was like the vibes are the way to transition into uh yes. into morning star <laughs> into morning star all right we have morning star number four The flame still burns. Jolene Garrett has at last found her son, Charlie. And all the Charlies have found her, too. Beneath the blank canopy of big sky stars, without her father's once steady influence, a lost and desperate Marbeth must recall Nathan's lessons and learn to fend for herself. Uh, This is coming to us from writers D.B. Andre and Tim Daniel, a friend of the pod, David Andre. Uh, yeah. The artist is Marco Finnegan. The colorist is Jason Wordy. And the letter is Justin Birch. Yeah. Jay, how'd you like, how'd you like issue four? I feel like every time I read this book, I want to give Marco Finnegan and Jason Wordy like a round of applause. Right. For, like, just fantastic. <laughs> like, I, I've talked about this before. Like, I would put so many pages of this book like up on my wall as like just a you know post because like, they're, they're gorgeous so good. they're so gorgeous but that ties in, why i'm specifically starting with that is not just randomly because i could always start with that but it's because the entire opening sequence here has such little dialogue and captions mm. like we are talking a few bubbles per page and then some pages with absolutely no dialogue and then it just kind of goes with that for like the first six pages or whatever and it's so effective at communicating so- story despite the limited uh, words and the limited typography on the page, um, the emotion is so strong. And that, I think that's what we've talked about mainly with Morningstar is that the emotion, it's like you mm-hmm. said, vibes. We're transitioning into another book that's so based on vibes. And it ha- it's so strong with that. And that's especially clear in this issue because this issue is kind of like that. I think issue five is the, the last issue, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, it is okay. to be concluded. Yeah. So this issue kind of serves as that point where, like, you're building the climax and then you have an issue that's, like, teetering you right there to just kind of build up the tension in, like, a yep. horror story. So this is this entire issue is just, like, teetering you on the edge. It's like, are you ready? Nope. Nope. Ha. We got you. Not actually happening yet. Are you ready? Oh, no, no. No, it's coming. And it really is effective in, like, building up that tension. So mm-hmm. I think this issue probably did exactly what it was intended to do for me, which is just kind of leave me teetering for that final issue to like oh, am i yeah. a baseball in this analogy i think i made myself a baseball in this analogy for me to be hit. 
clearly you're a tea ball that's teetering yeah, on yeah, tea. Yeah, that, 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 that was that was my thought. I'm like, am I? This issue is the tea. tea. You are the ball. I am the ball. Yeah. Uh, and the final <laughs> issue David will be the bat. And you, and you, again, they've got the bat, and they're gonna do this, like you know. Uh, I don't. I lost the plot. Um, but also, kind of the ending of this issue does a good job of kind of tying back to something that we saw earlier that we weren't sure Mm. if it's not the same exact thing, but it it kind of shows that that wasn't just something random and I'm not going to spoil it, but it's like, okay, no, there is a theme here. So everything's kind of coming back together and it's, it's seeming much more like there's a strong plan in place here for the entire arc. Yes. I would say this so far has been my favorite issue of Morningstar. I would agree with you. Uh, Because it has all of those amazing supernatural vibes, those, like, incredibly spooky, uh, you know, something's not quite quite right here, a very, like, kind of X-Files energy. But it also has what I think was phenomenal with the first issue uh, and with the other ones as well, which is, like, the the very well-done family dynamic between... Uh, Jolene and Charlie and their, their, like, incredibly creepy interaction. And then the flashback of Marabeth and her dad. Those are some of my favorite pages from the series, even yeah. though they don't have anything supernatural going on. And, like, seeing in this, in this book the way that, you know, she's using, like, her father's wisdom and stuff to survive out here when it's also, like, this kind of hostile ghostly presence that's haunting the family it's it's so well done and it Incredible. is really like emotional <clears throat> to like oh, see yeah. her as a child with her father and then to see her as still a child but so much more grown up because she's oh, yeah. lost her father it's it's so well done it may be incredibly emotional I, agree. Great I think, I think I, it's, it's it's evident throughout the way we've talked about i'm always a big fan of flashbacks i love flashbacks mm-hmm. in comic books i think they're incredibly effective and they've been one of my favorite parts consistently in, in morning mm-hmm. i think there might have been one issue without flash. it might have been issue three um because i think it was issue two where i was i think issue two was the last time i was like super praising the flashbacks maybe it was mm-hmm. issue there was one other issue that had really really strong flashbacks yeah. and it's back here and I'm glad that you mm. touched on it because yeah. I felt the need to touch on the incredible like art storytelling that opens this book. Oh. I'm glad you hit on the flashbacks, which are great art, but mainly done through the incredible dialogue. Mm-hmm. So it's just great that they know what part of the book needs which members of the creative team to help it shot. Yes. Like they let different we talked about it with um like the difference in Ain't No Grave and um uh Hunger in the Dusk. This book does it in different sections of the same book, which yeah. is incredible incredibly impressive and that's that's something we've been praising this book for for the entirety of the time of reading it this is such a cohesive team like they they really they work so beautifully together and as a a final thing on uh morningstar i feel like we don't do this super often i don't know that we've ever specifically done it before but i adore this cover like you said in terms of things to like put up on the wall like so many of the the panels and pages in this are just like gorgeous art pieces on their own and covers are like such a good example of that and this one in particular just really really phenomenal i didn't even spread it all the way out like yeah i feel like the covers of morningstar in general have been incredibly good yes i mean makes sense when you have an artist who's doing like beautiful interior and beautiful two-page spreads and stuff of course that artist can also do incredible covers exactly yeah. No, great. I'm glad Phenomenal. you Phenomenal. though. Yeah. But from one near conclusion to, to an, actual conclusion. an actual conclusion. Yeah, let's talk about the ending of uh, Sinister Sons. Sin oh. Sun's origin revealed in the final issue. The truth of Sin Sun's origin is at last revealed as he and his frenemy, Lorzad, make their mad dash for the throne on the planet Kurgar. It all ends here for the bad boys of comics. And if you thought these two deserve some sort of happy ending, think again. So we have Peter J. Tomasi as the writer. The artist is Vasco Georgiev. The colorist is Tamra Bonevillain. And the letter is Rob Lay. We've reached the end. End of the miniseries. Not really mm-hmm. the end of the story. Uh, because it's going to continue in Green Lantern. And uh, Sinesh is going to continue in Neil before Zod. But Katie, mm-hmm. how would you feel about the ending? I want to first shout how 
you you brought this up before, and it is really, really, really deeply on display in this issue. How phenomenal the writing for Sinestro is, oh, in yeah. that he is both very intimidating and like deeply in character, but also fits the vibe of the book so well. Like, I don't know that a you know Green Lantern appearance of Sinestro would have him say like, "Oh, did you want me to comment on your haircut?" Uh, but it fits so well here because it's intimidating in like all the right ways. It's you know deeply funny. <laughs> there, there's and also it, it, a, I'm not going to spoil, but there's a reveal of why he's acting the way that he's acting mm-hmm. initially, which of which which helped us so much. But I'm like, wait, Sinestro was characterized so well in the last issue. Why is he going like a little bit off? And the, and then it's reve- and I'm like, nope, that tracks. That's yep. so Sinestro. Yep. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they they do Sinestro so well, and that is incredibly important because what I think I've kind of been clamoring for from the start with this book is a common enemy that will really make Lorzad and Sinson feel like they're on the same side, and they they definitely get to do that a bit with Sinestro, uh, and then they also very much get to be on opposite sides in this book as yeah. well, which is nice because. You know, they've obviously had conflict with each other the entire time, but we haven't gotten to see them be, like, real enemies because the situations have been such that they're like, oh, we have to work together. Uh, So in this one, we both get really amazing, like, antagonizing between them and also really amazing teamwork between them, which I think was phenomenal. Because both of those are things that I, I deeply wanted from this book. I agree. Yeah. One of my notes is just to go over what you said, like great Sinestro Sinestroing, um, which <laughs> yep. just feels like so much. So issue. I feel like what you were clamming for in the early issues where you were like, ah, you know, it doesn't really work because Sin Sun and Lor Zod like don't have like, you know, their personalities don't rough it against each other. You know, like yeah. it, it doesn't give you that um, John and, and uh, Damien kind of dynamic. Mm-hmm. Who would have thought Sinestro was the other dynamic you needed for like right? them to bounce off of? Um, but he really was. And I love what he does for Sin Sun in this issue. Mm-hmm. And it really allows Sin Sun to kind of have some, some great moments in terms of where his character is going. I will say, as I kind of hinted at in the beginning there, it's really not a conclusion. And I don't know if you yeah. felt the same way. Where it's I like, this is the end of the miniseries did. and we're moving back to like seemingly backups to continue the story. And it's like, Mm. Hmm. I don't know if that's the best way forward for like actually ending the series and like moving forward with it. Um, I would have liked either another series or more issues or whatever. So again, I get that's like an editorial thing, how much time you get, whatever, but yeah, it didn't feel like the ending of this series. Exactly. So, yeah. That's my, that, that is, that is a good call. And uh, I definitely do agree. Also, just cause we did just do covers. Um, we mentioned this, Last time with Sinister Sons, I think that there's something wrong in editorial. Because, like, this cover, like, still has the whale. It still has the captain. It doesn't yeah. seem like the cover I mean, for the, the final issue. Off a little bit, too. Like, it feels like something has changed. Also, yeah, like, I'm wondering I don't if know if they, like, tie... drop David LaFuente completely as an art. Like, he was doing yeah. every other issue, like, originally, and he was solicited for every other issue throughout the whole series. But then he just got dropped. So I'm wondering if this series went through some like radical changes. I think that it did. And I was going to uh, say that in tying into what you were saying. I'm wondering if it's because they're like, oh, this is like doing better than we thought it was doing. Or it's doing worse than we thought it was doing. And they're like, okay, we're going to continue it in the backups. Which then changed. If it a bunch was of doing stuff. better, I do not believe that it would end up in backups versus like. No, I don't think experience. so either. My, uh, my 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 guess would be that like it's not necessarily that it was doing better or worse, but just that something happened in editorial where they were like, we mm-hmm. can't do the ending we intended, and for whatever reason that meant they couldn't finish the story here. So they went, okay, we'll give you some more backups to wrap it up, you know, because with all the changes we made you make, it makes sense that you can't finish it anymore. Yeah, um, and I think that also makes sense especially if this is the intended, you know, final cover that, because we were complaining about how much time we were spending in The Whale, and it's possible that this entire first arc was supposed to be, like, in The Whale. Um, Yeah. 
and so yeah, I, there there's certainly some kind of dissonance going on with the the end of this book that that does you know is a bit to the book's detriment. But the individual bit. pieces are still so good. I still love the art. We get a yeah. like three really great fight scenes. Are kind of three phases of one fight scene that is just yeah. really, really phenomenal. The art is still so great, um, even without the Fuente there. Because uh, George has been is, yeah. doing phenomenal oh, work. Yeah. I think both of the artists were great. I just wanted yes. to point that out as like a thing that maybe indicates that something yeah. happened. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I think it was a good issue. It's just mm-hmm. when it's placed in the finale slot that you're like, huh, was this really where we would go? Like, is this... If, when you look at the six issues, you're a little bit left. Like, I don't understand if this was the intended. It feels mm-hmm. like something's a little off there from an yeah. editorial perspective. Agreed. But, but anyway. Still super fun and still yeah. greatly written. Speaking of great writing, I suppose, because I don't think that super fun is a good descriptor for heart piece, even though it is no. like badass no. and cool. Uh, yeah. Um, Super fun is maybe not the vibe. <laughs> no, no. We are going to talk about Heart Piercer number three. Uh, as yeah. the werewolves wear down Briar Glen's defenses, Atala will go to every length to hold back the forces of the night. But it will all be in vain if she cannot overcome their fear and show them victory is possible. With the monstrous Howler himself bearing down on the village, however, it seems increasingly un likely here we have our wonderful creative team the script is rich duak the art is gavin smith the colors are nicholas bird uh i'm sorry bergdorf and the letters are ah justin birch yeah it's also doing uh morning star Indeed. yes in the same way that heart piercer is right up my alley we, I think we conflated the two of them before. It's like, oh, this is the Katie book, say, no, and this Jane, is the I J think. book. You just said yes. the same way that Heart Piercer is up my alley. I, I did yeah. mean Ain't No Grave, and I love that yeah. you immediately understood that, because yes, <laughs> I did. Uh, we I were like, Heart that. Piercer is like your, your, your yeah. energy. Yes. How do you well, feel about a creative team that I love so much. Uh, mm-hmm. Mitch Duke's a great writer, but especially, I think Gavin Smith's one of the best, and certainly one of the most underrated artists in comics currently. Like, I've been looking almost constantly at like original pages from heart Pearson being like should i should i drop like <laughs> a decent amount of money on that because i kind of want to <laughs> the answer is yes you should yeah I, I i love the art in this series so much and it, it's put together with just such a strong like world building both from a visual and from a writing perspective mm-hmm. like this is a world and i think i think we went over that it said volume one And so we think this is going, or at least intended to go beyond an initial volume. So Mm -hmm. especially with that in mind, this feels like it's set up to be such a good, like ongoing and continuous. Because we're not like, we're not moving forward by leaps and bounds each issue, which like, I want to point out, like this issue didn't like leap forward in the plot, which if we win a mini series that was only ever intended to be like, I might be sitting here like, maybe we should have moved a bit more. But if we're going to keep going, I am more than happy with how this is building and how this is going. We... uh, it has such a strong visual and like tonal perspective, both from mm-hmm. the writing and the art. And the characters are very strong too. Well, uh, the the main character is very strong, which is yes. yeah. Can I remember her name and right I think now? The Probably villains not. are very strong. Atala. That's true too. I really like the villains too. But yeah, I don't know. This is super fun. This issue is mainly action uh, with mm-hmm. like a little bit of plot movement, especially toward the end. There's an interesting like, I'll call it like it's not like a plot twist at the end, but like there's a like plot divot and correction at the end, which is really cool of like something that kind of unexpected happens and is, has to be addressed immediately, Mm -hmm. which I really don't want to spoil because it feels like one of the more important things in this issue. But I love that moment so much top to bottom. And I think Mm -hmm. it starts lending a more character to the, you know, other non-villain, non-protagonist characters, which I'm loving, especially if that continues. Um, but yeah, like I said, we don't move a ton forward in the plot, but we get a very strong uh, action-y issue, mainly, with a slight plot intrigue at the end. Yeah. I went so hard on this issue. Like, good, wise. The fact that they managed to fit in, like, all of the beats of, like, a city siege into one oh, yeah. issue, so phenomenal. Like, 
I don't think it's an exaggeration to compare this issue to like a full light, a full ass like Lord of the Rings movie. Like they fit so much <laughs> into into this it's issue like in climax, terms of you know, it's like the, exactly, the third, yeah. third act of um you know a, a, a big of two towers. Lord of the Rings. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it is so phenomenally. D- I was so excited the entire time they were doing it. Like they have the first sequence of the charging armies and the volley of arrows. They have the the second sequence of like the the scaling the walls and like they're breaching a bit. They have the the third sequence of like the walls are breaking and and like the way they do that is so rad as well. And throughout all of this, we get a tall more of a tall's backstory. We have a really wonderful flashback at the beginning uh, where we see. Uh, how Howler became Howler and like how Atala has like always kind of been, she's been like destined to break from the Dark Lord from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, like it's, it's so rad. I love this issue so much. It's probably aside from Ain't No Grave. I think it might be my favorite single issue from the, the like run of what we, uh, having this uh this episode uh i i love this issue so 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 much it might that's a good mm, there's that's a good question there's so many good issues in this we have a really strong like catch up here yeah i think as we've just continued pivoting more and more into like continuing books we like and dropping books we don't like we've gotten a very strong like uh line up here yeah so it's hard to say if it is but i do love this issue also I don't know how I how I missed it on the initial because I do have a big note of it here. The ending splash man. Oh my Woo! god. If that wasn't gonna be like ridiculous, that would be the like original page I would go for, but I know that thing's gonna be extensive <gasps> as all hell. <laughs> it's um so beautiful. It's so awesome. I love it. But yeah, no, you kinda hit it. It's it's like a siege movie, all like I don't know why in my mind when you said that it immediately went to um uh jack the giant slayer i was like ah it's like the final act of jack the giant slayer <laughs> i cut um, this boy in his beanstalk yeah yeah but it's it's awesome the action's so good and yeah we get some great plot movement at the end and uh, oh the dialogue is also great in this series just mm-hmm. another series that has really really good dialogue which i think is like you'll find that to be a trend in books that i really enjoy is when the dialogue's written very well because um, mm-hmm. dialogue can be very hit or miss in comic books. I also and, uh, love how stylized yeah. the dialogue in this book is. Like, it makes sense because it's like a fantasy book. Yeah, yeah. But they it has do a, a really good job of, of, like, yeah. Making do the as I say, organic. monster. Yeah. It's just going all oh. over I am right now. Like, just such a, like, strong fairy tale esque, like, you mm-hmm. know, um, classic. Dialogue. Absolutely. Love it. But, you know, some would say that uh, comics are modern fairy tales and there there is no comic <laughs> more comic than Local Man. There is no is comic more transition? comic? I mean... <laughs> I mean, fair. It's just such a funny sentence of there is no comic more comic. There's Honestly, no comic more comic. It has a great comic to, as the cover. Not to unbury the lead. I think this is actually my favorite issue of the... My favorite single issue of the week. Um, so. That's fair. We'll get there. But, uh, but yes, yeah. Local Man, number 12. Local Man is reunited with his former archenemy just in time to meet this new one. Their new one. Now Jack and Inga have to rescue the one man that hates them more than they hate each other to confront a villain who will change the future of the Image Universe by remaking its past. Yeah. Uh, our, yes, our, I, I got very <laughs> distracted. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to hear his thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> our writer, artist, and letterer here uh, is Tim Seeley, and our writer, artist, and letterer here is Tony Fleeces. Uh, the colorist is Felipe Sobrero and Brad Simpson on the like opposing uh, pages. And also Alan uh, Pasolaka. I'm not sure yep. what side... He did. But that's uh, he does it with Brad Simpson. Brad Simpson and Alan. Uh, yes, as perfect. Well, do it together. We anyway. love a a team. Anyway, Jack. Uh, yeah. Local yes. Man. Our second time being yeah. uh, caught up with Local Man as we've gone. This is the best issue of Local Man that there has been so far, in my opinion. This is one of the best comics. That's books so fair. I've read in a long time. Like this is so ridiculously good. 
it's not even funny. Like, as soon as we went, said, like, I was looking before, I was like, what is my favorite? And then, like, we immediately went to the local map. Like, oh, yeah, no, this was my favorite. Of the week. <laughs> this is so good. Um, I love, what's his, like, I can't remember her names. I don't know if it's said in this issue. His, like, sidekick girl that he, like, picked up to help him. Slick like, 2. 20 and then 40 bucks. Yeah. Slick 2 God, is so she... ridiculously funny at the start here where he's just, like, not doing anything. He's just, like, going, like, oh, yeah, no, Inga, this is, yeah, let's talk about what's going on. And she's like, hello? Can you, like, kill her or fight her or do anything? Like, she's a super villain. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> I it's also love so Mrs. Fun. Johnny Bushels from the bakery. She's <laughs> so funny. I also love, I don't know if this is, I don't think this is a spoiler. Like, later it is uh, revealed who, they're called the Faceless Horde, right? I believe yeah. is what they're called. The, the leader of the Faceless Horde is revealed. And then, I'm not going to talk about too much, they poke fun at their own reveal. Which is amazing because I, like, had the reaction and then went to the next page and... It's there from the book, too. And I'm like, I love the way that this book just, like, understands itself and the comic book medium in such a fun way that they get to play with stuff like that. It but reminds me so much of uh, that scene in, oh, what Justice League cartoon is it? Where Lex switches bodies with... Uh, oh, yeah. Where it's well, because it's, it's um, very you know... I have yeah, no idea. The Wally voice actor is also Lex Luthor in Smallville, so he's like, so it's like a extra layer of satire and then he just takes it off he's like i have no idea what this is and it's so funny um but yeah anyway it's not all humor i started with the humor because it's yeah. so funny but we get into some like heavier and very cool stuff here the scene with the chief is amazing and mm -hmm. then we get i'm not gonna spoil it but we get a moment between inga um and um like jack I don't know why I, I just got stuck on that for a second. Uh, uh, between Inga and Jack, where like something happened, and it is damn emotional and awesome. I love it so much. And then the flip side is just always fun. Uh, it's always fun. The flip side is just always fun. Yeah, the flip side was so much fun. It's so there's also like uh, an, uh, what do you what do you call it when they uh, like do the same thing? What do you call it? Parallels. Like, no, no, no. As like another book, like when you know, like they do it with a cover. So homage. A lot of times. Homage. Yeah, there's an homage page to like one of the most famous Spawn pages, um, which is cool because instead of it being like, uh, with all the DC and Marvel characters with Spawn on the outside, it's like done with all of like the most famous indie comic characters, and it's with um, this like Tiki dude, <laughs> and I. Oh, I just what's his that name? Fun. Big something, right? Uh, I don't remember what his name is, but anyway, I don't want to get too, uh, no, okay. too sidetracked. Big Island. This issue just does everything so well. It does humor it does. so well. It does plot build up so well. It does emotional beats so well. It does character arcs so well. It's really just a top tier issue of a top tier comic book series. Like this Absolutely. is local man back on top like i know we've been like this arc is good but maybe not as much as we were enjoying like you know the first arc stuff like this is local man back on top in my humble opinion i'm i'm gonna absolutely agree with you there and i think one of the big things is that i think we talked about this talking about one of the kirkman books at one point where it's so apparent when reading a book or no i think it was with a, a mark wade book where it's like it's so apparent when you can tell that someone is like the biggest comic book fan in the world uh, and they're writing comic books. And I it, certainly think we just, said that about Kirkman books on multiple I think occasions. probably both of them. Yeah, um, yeah. I think we said that about Battle Pope, funny enough. Like, I think Battle Pope was one book it where It definitely like, was Battle Pope. Yeah, Check where we were like, this is so episode. clearly made by somebody who loves comic books on such a deep yes. level. Yeah, and I, I get that same amazing energy from Local Man. Where it's like, okay, Tim Seeley and Tony Fleece, you two are writing this from inside the house. Like, oh, yeah. like you said with the reveal, where it's like, I don't know, who the fuck is that? Uh, it, <laughs> it's like so... It's, it's done with such love for the format and yeah. the form. And I, I think the fact that it's the... the um, what have you been calling it? Flip where, I love that it's a flip book. The fact, the fact that it's a flip book is such a testament to that because not only are they doing the, you know, kind of more modern, 
maybe playing with the idea of classic comic books a bit, but they're also just doing a classic comic book as well, which is so fun. Cause it's like, oh yeah, I oh, want to yeah. write this comic that's got some, like something to say about uh, like comics and heroes and we'll maybe have a bit of a meta plot going on. But then also I just want to write a super fun nineties comic book. It, which is literally can... set in the 90s image universe, which is like yeah. extra cool. It's like, I'm just going to do it. Like, I'm going to do it <laughs> in continuity with all these books. Back then, I'm not going to be like, okay, yeah, I'll be with Spawn and Savage Dragon now when they've been around. <laughs> like, no, no, no. I'm going to set this where they were in the like early 90s when they were starting. Like, I'm going to act as if I was one of the like image founder or like first yes. and second gen image books. You know, it's like, I'm going to pretend that I was there with, with Spawn and with Cyberforce, and with the Max, and with Savage Dragon, and with Youngblood, and I'm just going to put myself, at, and Wildstorm, and all those, and I'm just going to put myself in the middle of all that, so that I can and, live out, like, what seems to be my dream, to be, like, I was you know, about to say, and to, you know, again, draw parallels to things that we've said about Kirkman, how fucking rad is it that they get to do that? Like, Kirkman getting the Transformers and G.I. Joe properties, and these guys get to play around in classic uh, classic image. It's it's so fun to see people who are clearly having fun with what they're doing. Yeah, it's it's just fantastic. But really I don't good. know if you have anything else for Local Man. It's really damn good. Like, it's Local Man is so worth a read. It's one of the series that I will really push on people so hard right now. Because, one, it's a, ongoing. So it just and keeps going. And we ongoing. It's so good. Um, but it's also just such a good series. Anyways. Yes. Speaking of image and really good series. I they were going to say speaking of ongoings. Um, <laughs> is it an ongoing? Yeah, they said they're going to go on hiatuses because Jason Fabok can't draw an issue a month, but it's intended to. Mm -hmm. All the Ghost Machine books, I believe, are intended to just keep going. Love it. Um, speaking of ongoings, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've also got Rook Exodus number four. Who wants to oh, oh, Is it? There we go. Properly proportioned. Ah, uh, you, you're getting all the face mask ones. I love that. I have, because they're so yeah. badass. <laughs> oh, that's fair. Rook Exodus number four. It is all out war on the planet Exodus. The bear warden Ursaw wants to wants complete control over the world, and he'll destroy anyone and anything in his path. Rook, Direwolf, and their newfound allies are the only remaining wardens left to stop them. The question is. What could Ursa possibly want with a dying planet everyone else is trying to escape? The creators here are Jeff Johns and Jason Fabok. Jeff Johns doing the script and Jason Fabok doing the art. Uh, Brad Anderson is doing the colors and Rob Lay is the letterer. Jay. Yeah. We have been going a little feral for this book. Yes. How let do me, you let feel me about issue four? Let me see if I can very quickly show you everything that you need to know about this book. Look at this page. I'm sorry if you're not here visually. It's a three panel page with just the most captions. Like, yes. ever. Then flip the page. Here's a two page spread with one caption on it. Like, just a team that knows how to vary what they're doing depending on what a moment mm -hmm. calls for. What's necessary. This is a climax. We get a climax at issue yeah. three. Which... And like a, a damn good climax at, at issue, sorry, at issue four, which like gives, I'm going to give the team a lot of credit for doing that because we, I, and yeah, I think, I think that is considered the first story arc because the way they set up like the next thing looks like it's a new mm -hmm. story arc. So I think this is the first story arc. Really well done. Really great climax. We get kind of, I'm not going to spoil how it goes, but kind of the setup and eventual climax of this issue is kind of Rook deciding like, okay, I'm getting revenge on for Swine now. Like, I am getting revenge. Mm -hmm. Screw that. I need to save his hog, which also character growth for Rook actually oh, caring about an animal instead of being mm -hmm. like, no, they're just doing what the helmet says. Like, no. Like, I know Swine would be disgusted to see his hog helping this monster. Like, I'm going to get revenge. I'm going to go off. And that's kind of where the climax comes. I'm not going to tell you how that goes for him, but I'm going to tell you it's badass. I'm going to tell you Jason Fabok is one of the best artists in comic books. I'm going to tell you that Jeff Johns knows how to write the emotion and the dialogue and everything as we're getting through this climax. And I'm going to tell you, this issue ends on such a cool note 
for the future story right? arc. Despite being a climax for what has come so far, we get such a good ending to set up what comes. So, yeah, I love this issue. This is fantastic. This is another issue that's up there with one of the best of the week. Like, this it is so really, cool. really is. It's so phenomenal. I... I need to gush about Jason Faybox. Like, I was doing so before we it. even started recording. Because from the jump, the way that this book... And, it, gosh, it's, like you said, it's so clear that this is a team of just seasoned comic book veterans. Because from the jump, the strong sense of identity on this book, the way that you could see a character in isolation... And say, not only do I know what book they're from, I understand what, like, they are. That is so insane to be able to pull you off. You know I have such a problem with names in comics, but you never, ever ha find that in what exists because it's so evident. It's so evident. And so fucking cool. And the way that he, specifically in the context of a book like Rook Exodus, the way that he draws his animals are so phenomenal like we saw a bit of that in heart piercer as well with the wolfmen they're like gorgeous they have like oh yeah in, in heart piercer they have like an almost kind of like kind of like classic japanese element to them with the way that their hair curls that is like super super rad but here all of the animals are like so i don't even know how to describe it because they're they're expressive like look at this mythical i don't here. know they feel straight out of myths like all right myths. no matter how like common an animal they are they feel mythological and i yes. don't know what that is. maybe it's the eyes maybe it's like I the like glowing effect he gives to like all the eyes and i think a lot of it is also look just that. how powerful they feel yeah, like, like look, look at that look at what it's going on with the eyes there like that yeah. has such a like mythological feel to it it anyway, really really does like, um and I mean, a lot of them are also like larger than life versions of themselves because of yeah. how they were like bred on Exodus. And it's just, they are so much, they are so important to the plot. Like the way that you feel about these animals and the way that these animals come across, they bring so much like fear. And it's, it's really rad to see how like, we're afraid of the wardens. Like, absolutely. Uh, Ursa, and I forget what the snake lady's name is. Um, do you remember? Uh, I don't remember right now. That's so fair. Um, like, we're afraid of them as individuals, and the way that Jason Fabok does the action with them and the animals, like, kind of working in tandem is so rad. Like, especially with the snake lady, I feel like, um, ah, her name is Ka. Mm. That might not be her, like, warden name, but it's, uh, in any case, the way that she and her snake work together is such a, like, dynamic and cool fight. Because, like, it's not just, like, a person versus a person or a person versus a giant of a monster. It is this like combination of the way that Ka and her snake work together that creates such a rad and dynamic sequence with Direwolf. And I, so much of that has to do with the way that Jason Fabok is able to blend these these animals in in a way that is important to the story that they are blended in. Absolutely, one hundred percent. And and this is like we talked about. Um, earlier like execution over concept this is like such a strong concept that is then executed incredibly yes well. like this is such a cool when you hear everything's been done in comic books i'm always somebody who or, like everything's been done in fiction i'm somebody who always pushes it back on that because i think that's a dumb idea like i don't mm. think that's true like yeah you're gonna take beats and stuff but the idea that like there's nothing unique or new i don't think is true and i think this is something that exemplifies that we like, yes, punch flannery o'connor in the face in this house yeah like you can you know um, you can probably find something somewhat similar, but like, this is a unique book. Like, yes, there's, there'll be books where like, okay, yeah, that power set's been used before that, but this is so unique. The idea of helmets controlling animals, that's not something that you can be like, ah, yes, I can think of something where there's helmets that control animals. Like, that's a fairly unique concept, and then it's executed just perfectly oh, yeah. by 
one of the strongest. And like, I know that the intention of there's no new stories is supposed to be like, oh yes, clearly this is the story of a man against nature or a man against another man or whatever. But it's like that's such bullshit. Like, yeah, like no, this is so this cool. Is bullshit. This is so cool yeah. and unique. <laughs> yeah. Like, don't tell me this has been done before because I have read a lot of goddamn comic books and I've never read anything like this. Like, this is such a unique and cool thing. And that's not to say there's anything bad about doing something that's less unique and exactly. doing it well. Look at Local Man. That's not really a unique story. It's just a story done incredibly mm -hmm. well. And we just gushed about how goddamn good that is. But yeah. this takes a different angle. And I love that. It's, but, it's so phenomenal. Yeah. I could keep gushing about it all day, but I think we should probably <laughs> move on to uh, to something to else fingers. to gush about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the Six Fingers. Our, so our we're done. actual conclusion. We're done with um, the one hand and the Six Fingers. It, it has all come to this, and now it's over. I know Katie's been saying for, for months she just couldn't wait for it to end because she really, really hates the one hand and That's the Six right. Fingers. That's yeah. right. I've been, I've been chomping at the bit. You've been forcing me to read it. I have. Uh, I'm, I'm very sorry. But yeah, uh, let's let's get into the description. This is the, the mini series finale. Soaked in blood and oh, steeped you're doing it. in the secrets of Neo Novena, there may only be one way out for Serial Killer Joannis in the bone-chilling conclusion of the gruesome series. The writer is Dan Waters, the artist is Sumit Kumar, the colorist is Lee Luridge, and the letter is Adita Bittaker. Katie, yeah, you're so excited. You tried to jump in on the uh, <laughs> the intro of it. I did. Um, I did. You want to talk a little bit to us about the ending of this this duo series, and specifically this issue, obviously. But nah. we'll do a whole thing for both of the two series. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Yes, obviously, I, I deeply, deeply do. So these companion books have had me by the throat for months, and I was so hyped to read this after reading the one hand conclusion because the way that uh, these stories have been being told, like kind of in parallel, but out of step with each other, like the, the two different uh, perspectives, we were so excited to see where it was going with the conclusion because like, you know, we read the conclusion of the one hand. So like, we kind of were like, Oh yeah, we, we get a bit of what's going to conclude in the six fingers but they did such a good job with the one hand being just like a hype up book for the six fingers, as well as being an amazing conclusion for the one hand. I love this book so much. Like the, the idea of like from if I, it's so rad, it's hard for me to vocalize. <laughs> or, uh, she has uh, been, she has, Katie has been stunned in a silence, which is a hard thing, a hard goddamn it, thing to do. <laughs> It is. I'm a chatty Cappy. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those books where if you handed me the first issue or if like I went back in time and talked to myself after reading the first issue, I would not have been close to being able to guess where it was going because the reveals are done so well, because all the groundwork is... And this is like the biggest thing. I know that I keep cutting myself off, but all of the groundwork that they do in this book is the perfect kind of like mystery fiction groundwork where looking back on it, it all makes sense. But looking forward or like, you know, reading it at the time, it doesn't look like clues. Like it, it, it all like comes together in the end in well, a way that it. makes everything make sense. And it never felt confusing as you were going along. It's just like, oh, this thing that I Except took when for they granted. Wanted to be confused. You know, like, I think we talked about that versus, like, other mysteries. Like, when yeah. something was like, you were like, wait, what? That's weird. Like, it'll come mm. back and it'll be like, ah, that's, that's why that thing was weird and out of place. Yes. And this does it so elegantly in such a way that, like, keeps you, like, just going with the ride because you're so excited to be on the ride. I it, I was so thrilled with this conclusion specifically. I uh, cuz I I I really like the conclusion for the one hand. I feel like that was very much the conclusion for Ari whereas this is the conclusion for the story for the world uh, uh, as a as a whole and the won't get into it 
because major spoilers, but the like ending of this book, insane, insane, phenomenal, so cool. I, it gave me chills to read it, and it's giving me chills <laughs> to think about it. Uh, it's like I know that that so wasn't cool super too, coherent, with but like I'm passing visuals. it to you because I'm not uh, yeah, going to get yeah. more coherent. Yeah, there, there's like a visual element that like starts this issue, and then like not the exact same visual element ends the issue, and it's just a cool little like comic book book endy thing that I really enjoyed. Right. But I'm gonna say I think I said this like basically at the top of the one hands finale too. I'm so excited to read the collected edition and like do an episode on that because it feels like something that's gonna be so cool to like it's been so cool to read monthly and uh, i guess yes. bi-week however you want to talk about the duo series it's been cool to read as it's come out and i'm glad mm-hmm. that we got to read this as it came out actually oh, yeah it's like such an awesome experience but i am super excited to read this all the way through i'm like this, then i'm gonna like just start like writing things down like early <laughs> on that i'm like ah yes this hints at what's coming and anyway be I digress. Scrawling in the comic. Yeah, yeah. This is such a cool uh, issue. There's a great. It's so early, but is it a spoiler to say who he talks to, who doesn't recognize him? Like, is that is that a spoiler? It's a I'm fantastic. Say no. scene. Okay, so he talks to his father, but not his father. Yep. You know, because um, he's uh, um. What do they call him? Not since. Cogs? That's you... Fallout. Cogs, Cogs. that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I, been... I don't know if they've ever used this word, but I'm going to use this co- uh, word. He's been recogged. Um... <laughs> <laughs> they turn him off and turn him on again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they, and, oh, shit, all his memories go. Reset him, yeah. You know, they yeah. held the factory reset button on him. Exactly, yeah. Plopped him into a new place. And, the... and that, like, that's such a cool idea that they, like, just move the cogs around. Mm-hmm. Because also name cog it makes sense that you can like move a cog around and it'll keep shit but it's so cool and then that scene or that sequence because it's a fairly long sequence i feel like um yeah yeah it's like a solid six or seven eight pages something like that is so good and i think it makes up the meat of like like you get the conclusion which like is so good from like a you know unit standpoint of the series but in terms of like an individual issue enjoyment factor that sequence is the meat of what's going to give you your enjoyment in this issue because it's so oh, yeah. maybe satisfying isn't the right word because it's almost like anti-satisfying mm-hmm. but it's like such a good meaty like you get to figure out kind of how things work and then you get to like see what's the it's johannes right is his name yeah. johannes or johannes whatever you get to see I like i call him johannes but i don't know if johannes right. whatever his name is um gets such a cool like moment of realization and then like how he decided to progress from there that Ooh. i won't spoil how he no, deals yeah. with the, the the interaction but it's so good another thing i keep talking about dialogue today because there's been great dialogue today which i appreciate yeah. the dialogue in this issue but especially actually in the opening the dialogue's fantastic too but especially in that um sequence is just so strong and the characterization of both johannes or johans and I'm not even going to say his father, but, like, the system that his father, like, represents mm-hmm. gets characterized there. And it's just such a cool dichotomy. And I enjoy the the, the hell out of it. But, yeah, Ugh. there's my... that's. I think that's the most succinct and, like, focused I can be with my thoughts on the issue. Because it is just a, a mindfuck. Um, it really, really is. And to, again, not give, like, a spoiler as to what it is, the reveal about the the like symbols and stuff so oh that's 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 so, so yeah, cool yeah. you get that like, at, not like, only the like, very going end. on with it but like what the purpose of it is yeah, like, and like page. where it came from oh my god yeah you get that like four pages before, or actually like a solid six pages before the end but yeah no that's that's something that definitely was worth huge yeah. highlight for me I uh, yeah anyway we have we've gushed about this for quite a bit of time, so yes, do we want yes, to yes, yes, yes. move over Let's... to another great issue? Void Rivals. All right, this is Void Rivals number eleven, and in classic Void Rivals fashion, it's a very short summary. War in the wasteland. Zertonian forces have caught up to Darak and Salila, but thankfully they have a little Cybertronian help. Springer to the rescue. 
uh, the creative team. Here we have our boy Robert Kirkman on the script. We've got Lorenzo De Felici as the artist, Patricio Del Pece as the colorist, and Russ Wooten as the letterer. To Bird. Yes. <laughs> oh my word. Kirkman's the man. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, this is such an interesting issue. Um, by the way, which super plays into the strengths of Lorenzo De Felici on art. Like, there's just so much for him to do in this issue. Mm-hmm. And it's fantastic. But why I say this is an interesting issue is it almost feels like it's two issues. If that makes sense, like we it have does. what kind of feels like a climax or a big moment for Void Rivals, and that's maybe like the first half of the issue, and then we go into like Energon Universe and like mm-hmm. just things going on in the world that might come back for them, that might come back for other things like Transformers stuff, like you know, just like full blown Hasbro existing property stuff, all in the back half of this issue, and it's so cool because even like the like I say that like. It doesn't literally start with the Transformer on the first page. Like, there is a Transformer, like, baked yes. now into where Void Rivals currently is. But, I mean, like, outside of that, we go even deeper into it. And, like, without Solila and Derek, kind of, in the back half. So, mm-hmm. I think that's really cool that we kind of get two things here. We get what feels like plenty for Derek and Solila in this issue. And oh, yeah. it's awesome. And that's the, the strongest part of this issue. Mm-hmm. And it's... Like mainly carried through like an awesome a- an awesome action sequence, but that shows off Solila and Derek's personalities so, so well. freaking well that it's fantastic. And then we kind of go into the the Ender John stuff, which is enjoyable. I think it's you know a little bit less so than like the you know focus on our yeah. characters, but. But that's kind of been our vibe for most of Void yeah. Rivals. It's like, okay, when we go to the Transformers yeah. stuff, it's less our wheelhouse. But the stuff that's focused on the Void Rivals stuff is so ridiculously strong in this issue. And um, yes. also there's an interesting thing brought up with like a key in this issue. And I remember just being like, oh, a key. Well, what's going on there? I want to know. I want to I wanna, I wanna know what the key opens. Key. Keys are, <laughs> key. keys are in, in, innately interesting because they have to open something. And then, like, that's multiple questions. Like, what's the key? Well, what does it open? Well, what then? What's in the thing that it opens? And why so, is it locked? <laughs> yeah. So keys are just we love exciting. we love and the narrative importance of a key. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am so jazzed because I I loved Volume One of Void Rivals when we did our bonus yeah. episode on it, and as we've been reading Volume Two, I've been a little less jazzed on it. And I feel like this is the third that issue in a row where you said like I was less jazzed, but now I'm more jazzed. <laughs> So I don't in know how my long defense. you keep playing that card. <laughs> it, look, it, it was the, it was this it was the first half of this arc that yeah. I was like, and it's because I I was so so incredibly hype on uh, volume one that it was like a betrayal that I didn't like the first couple issues of volume two. Uh, but like you said, I've been saying this for a few issues now. Uh, where <laughs> it's really just hit its stride again, and I am fully back on the Void Rivals train. Like you said, this, specifically the fact that this fight is done in a way that highlights Dark and Salila, their differences and, like, their personalities. And Dark has, like, a really wonderful bit where he's not being particularly effective and uh, Springer is, like, making fun of him and he's making fun of himself and Android is making fun of him, him, yes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and first of all I love that Salila was not making fun of him in that instance uh, she was like no I am focused on what I am doing because that's also very in character for her she's not going to stop to quip um, but she does stop to like defend him and like her because she is such a this woman has she has not in her life even seen a silly goose uh, she does not have a funny bone in her body, and I love this for her. <laughs> in her life, seen a silly <laughs> um, And there's also, like, incredibly wonderful plot and characterization things that have to do outside of, outside of the fight, like, with yeah. the, the data pad and stuff. And it shows, you know, a sense of leadership from Darek that I think is going to make that makes sense as we know that he's like the son of the king of his people. And it's like, oh, oh, I think we're seeing some groundwork being laid here. Um, yeah, the Transformers side of it, I'm like, 
fine. I'll read it. <laughs> it's whatever. Like, yeah, it's an important part. I, like, I get it. It's a piece in the universe, but also, like... Oh, well, like, I don't know who this TV screen head yeah, person yeah. is. I'm like, I don't know who any of these people are, and I feel like I'm supposed to be getting hyped, but, like, I don't right? know who they are. I'm like, whatever. Take me back to Dark and Salila. <laughs> and they do. For the last and couple they do. pages. And a yeah. crazy issue ender. Um, yes. Which is going to take about. me to my my kind of one gripe because i i accept the existence of the transformers uh plot lines going on i feel like my gripe with salila keeps being that she's so like she keeps being like oh i've grown as a character and let me say that i've done this and then she keeps like you know i guess like acting on instinct or whatever and it's like okay salila calm down We've seen yeah. you do this same bit like three times. Please just chill. Yeah, it's it, it's it's interesting. It, I I don't know like fully. Intent- I think this is a little bit different because I think this issue was really intent to show that she's grown and changed, and it really did until that. So I think there's something else going on with that. So I'm not. I'm going to reserve Probably. judgment on that until we figure out fully what's going on because I don't think it's all that. I think it's more than meets the eye. But anyway, I don't know if you That's have anything fair. else on Void Rivals. I no, nothing nothing more on Void Rivals. Are we ready to get to our final poll of the catch-up? are. It's a very special poll. It's a it very is. special poll. Coming to us because from if you Friend wanna, of the yeah, Pod. Go back to issue episode five of, I think it's five, might be six. I I'll think so, it. yeah. On the podcast. We interviewed one Nick Mueller on Winnie the Pooh, Demon Hunter. You might be asking... Well, this is issue one. It just came out. How, how did you interview him about this way back then? Well, this is a Kickstarter book that has been picked up by Antarctic Press yes. for a four-issue run. Hell yeah. Which is super cool. It you want really, to give really, our, really our, our little intro here, Katie? Yes. Winnie the Pooh, Demon Hunter, number one. Talking bear fights demonic forces, lovable companion, and lethal combatant, all in one. Deep in the 100-acre woods, Christopher Robin and his good friend Pooh Bear protect the land from demonic threats. But what happens when Piglet disappears? Can they find him before it's too late? Uh, yeah, writer and illustrator, all of everything really is coming to us from Nicholas Mueller. He does he does it all on this book. He does it all. He, he does he's, it all. he's a very talented man. Very, very talented now, Jay, man. I think you've... I've read all this before. You've yeah, read these before, the, yeah. I think... Because there's something that says, like, Antarctic Press edits here, so there might be some slight changes to the dialogue and stuff. Nothing big enough that mm-hmm. I noticed the change, because I've read it... This is my third time reading this, because I, I reread it when the last volume came out. Um, so nothing was, like, huge enough for me to notice any, like, real edits being made. Um, but in any case, yes, I've read this before. I love Winnie the Pooh Demon Hunter. It's been one of my favorite, if not... It probably is my favorite Kickstarter book, um currently i think it's so ridiculously good i think there's a reason it's now in stories because i think nick is exceptionally talented and it's just such a cool way to use winnie because it's not we're gonna throw him in a horror movie or we're gonna like do it's so true to it has a lot of, i think we, we talked about this when we interviewed nick like it has a lot of heart to it you know like mm-hmm. it's a book with a lot of heart and it kind of plays with these themes and what i love about this issue specifically is we open with like very traditional Pooh and Christopher Robin hijinks. Yeah. It's like, here's Winnie and Christopher Robin as you know them, and then we're going to jump forward and here's them as demon hunters. Mm-hmm. And they still have the same dynamic, but they're just in a new context. And I love that and the way that that's delivered to the audience so much. And so much of this is Nick just being so good at like twisting things and coming up with like a new way to look at things without fundamentally changing what they are mm-hmm. like i think um the powers he gives to the gingerbread man and making him into like clayface is so cool and right. so fun um yeah it's just a super fun book we also have mayor humpty dumpty in this red riding hood like there's just a lot of really cool stuff also something i want to call out that's so cool because it's just something i always noticed with nick style is nick will do these like character introduction splash pages and he renders them like look at normal art and then look at the way that yeah. he renders the splash like he renders it differently so that it draws your attention in such a cool way it's similar to, like this cover doesn't really look like his typical style because he like renders these like splashes in important mm-hmm. moments so differently also nick was talking about uh wanting to improve his cover ability look at that cover 
It's really fucking awesome. Cover. Like the cover is so phenomenal. Um, you're great, Nick. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I don't know, Katie. You want to? You want to? You want to take over? I love this issue so much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what shocked me? Uh, because I had not read this going into it. I didn't realize how like very anime manga inspired. Oh yeah. The uh the art and the storytelling is in this. Like, if you remember like when it was supposed to come out in the collective thing, it was gonna come out through manga Z, if you remember. Yeah, I did I book. didn't yeah. like put it together though. I was like, oh maybe yeah. that's just like, you know, Antarctic Press doing their their anthology type thing. Yeah. Um But yeah, it's it's very, very anime inspired, very manga inspired, which is super fun and I think it adds another element of the another element of effort to the adaptation of Winnie the Pooh. Cause one of my favorite things that we talked to Nick about uh, back when we interviewed him for the book, uh, for the pod was the way that he talked about how his original idea was not very like Winnie the Pooh, but then he like talked it through with his wife and he like started reading the Winnie the Pooh stories to his kids and was and, like fell in love with the character. And the book became so much better because of that. And you can really see that on the page where it's like, this is Absolutely. done with a delight for the characters. Um, and we, we love to hype writer artists on this pod. It's oh, yeah. such an incredible talent to be able to produce a book completely on your own, like yep. insane to be able to write and draw an entire and color comic. And, and letter color and letter like this he's, is not just writer this is one man team he's got some editors involved uh i think yeah. matthew d riz does uh story edits to help him out but uh yeah this is this is basically pure nick which is just yeah which is impressive. just so impressive so so cool and so delightful i love the immediate character dynamics like you said between uh Pooh and christopher robin but yeah. also between Red Riding Hood and, and sorry, what? Like the two when they get stuck in the gingerbread, and the two yep. of them just have one of my favorite exchanges. It's so funny. Oh man, yeah, it's it's, it's they, it's they are so delightful. funny together. Anyway, continue. But not only okay, just writing. them. Also, once Little Red comes in, you immediately understand their their character dynamics and the way that she deals with Humpty Dumpty is so funny. And the way yep. that he acts is is great. There's there's just such good. It's just a book full of such good elements, and it, it just comes together into such a fun story and such a well done agree. book. I'm very excited. If, if you haven't oh, gotten a copy yet, just please, because please you mentioned up, the rendering for those of you on the video pod, check out yeah. this little red. Like, like those splashes that he does, phenomenal, are just incredible. Um, really, really good I think stuff. There's, I think there's one more in this issue, if I'm not mistaken, with like the one villain guy who comes. In. Oh, oh, there's one on the last page too. I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. Which is yeah, it's not really a spoiler, so I'll just I'll show that. Fantastic. Yeah, super, super, super cool. You love to see all the elements come together, and it's really rad to have you know heard the story behind the story and then read the story. Yeah, it's awesome. Again, if. if I'm sure you can find copies uh, at various stores. Or you, mm -hmm. I think Antarctic Press sells issues of their books on their website too. So you should be able to get a copy if you don't have one yet. A book that I highly recommend checking out. Uh, Nick's also about to launch the Kickstarter for what's now considered book three, but it's like the fourth uh, like thing. And it's interesting Tigger because Tigger's in the public domain now too. So yes. yeah. check that out. Check out Nick. All Nick's stuff will be linked. Yeah. And I think anyway. he also has uh, a lot of great stuff available on uh, his like Amazon storefront to get like full volumes. And that's stuff. true. That's true. And sure a lot of the stuff is free on Global out. Comics. Like he has a mm -hmm. lot of stuff, so you can like catch up. That's how I read um, Demon Hunter Raven after it started in exciting comics. I continued reading that on uh, on Global Comics. So if you have a Global, Com I don't know if it's free on Global Comics or if you need the Global Comics paid version. I have the paid version of Global Comics, so I, I don't know. But check it out on Global Comics too. A lot of the stuff's on there. Yeah. Find a way to read it, because Nick's stuff is definitely worth the read. In any case, though, that'll bring us to the Chanel. end of our polls catch-up. We have caught up on our Eleven polls. Eleven books. Eleven books. And we are going to have, finally, a normal episode coming out again this coming Wednesday. Yes. So, um, please, please check that out. Um, finally, for the first time in a long time, we can say it and it will be true. 
We will hopefully see you all next week. Comic Geeks! <laughs>